to kind of give you a little bit more detail, where it's not only going to be about as it pertains to GHR structure, as in uh, one of the earlier webinars that we did with V11 benefits enrollment, um, I'm going to kind of take the S3 stance and say, you know, this is where it is on S3, and Matt's going to kind of show you what it looks like and what the differences are in GHR. So again, hopefully that everybody gets something out of this. Um, and with that, let's go ahead and get started. I think we, mm -hmm. we came up with this topic because it's something that we encounter as the first step with not only any implementation, but um, our assessments. Everything always reverts back to the org structure. If the foundation's right. not set up well, then you'll see a lot of issues that stem from it later on. So I think you know um, Matt's done this topic before. At, at um, in forum mm -hmm. and at a couple of other venues. So we're lucky that he brought it in his toolkit over to RPI. So we're, we're able to give you this awesome presentation. So thanks, Matt. No problem. Yeah, and it's also, uh, it's overlooked because there's a lot of power behind it and we don't really look at it because we're very limited in the S3 world in terms of what we can do with it. GHR kind of opens those doors and we're able to really do a lot more with it. So hopefully we can illustrate some of those points for you. So, all right. Yeah, so um, we'll just kind of start talking about what anybody that's on S3 or came from S3 understands. The GHL, the GL structure, supervisor structure, and department structure are really what defines your organizational structure there. You don't have a lot of flexibility. You, you know, it is what it is. It's very hierarchical. Um, and also, if it's not set up correctly, you will not either be able to report very well, you will not be able to use your manager self-service application, and um, there are other consequences that you notice if something is set up incorrectly in one of these three structures. And again, this is, uh, when we look at the GL, this really is your, your accounting unit, your sub-account unit, your cost centers, those types of things, and that's what I'm talking about when I talk about the GL, GL structure in the HR environment. So now when we get to the GHR side, we've got a lot of the same kind of components. We still have our chart of accounts or cost centers if you really want to stick with that, although they're starting to phase that out slowly but surely. Yeah. Um, we do have our supervisory structure as well, which we're kind of used to. It's still kind of tried and true. There's a little bit more functionality behind it on the GHR side. But then we move into this whole concept of organization units rather than the traditional process level department uh, relationship that we're very, very used to in the S3 world. Um, the biggest takeaway from the organization structure, as you can already tell, we're talking about really that today, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of flexibility behind it. Um, in the old S3 world, we're so used to that company process level department. Those are the pieces that you've got to work with no matter what you do. When we get to GHR, the biggest difference is we can have any number of levels in the org structure that we want. We also get to define what those are. So we can really reflect your organization as it really is supposed to be. We also have the power to take any of those units that we put out there and suppress them. So if we want to add a couple layers that really nobody should ever have a work assignment assigned to on them, we can suppress that, hide it from even the pick list. So nobody, when they're creating a job or a position or even on somebody's work assignment, nobody can choose that accidentally. We don't have uh, the, the data errors. They're not going to be able to select something that's not valid. Um, and then we've got a lot of other information surrounding the org unit that gives us a lot more information and insight about that organization unit itself. So we'll go into that in just a moment. So, so I think the big takeaway from this is org structure is not supervisory structure and it is not accounting structure. In S3, that's what we're used to. We had those really three... Limitations. Yeah. The, the, the way the system limited, limited you into putting your data in. So while it didn't really reflect what your organization was like when you really charted it out outside the system, that's all you could get to in S3. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, it was always a uh, square peg and round hole, mm -hmm. no matter what we did. We always had to 
be confined by those. Here, we're totally different. Uh, we can do a true organization structure. We can reflect your organization as it really, really is. Um, the other thing is, this is really great for something like a matrix organization. Um, so for those of you who might not be familiar, you might have a supervisor over here who actually also supervises somebody over in a totally different area. You might have somebody in finance reporting to somebody in HR. Um, that is totally valid with these kinds of structures. We're able to build that very easily in GHR. And, and one person, which we see a lot, may have multiple supervisors depending on what shift they're working. Mm -hmm. And that was very hard to reflect in the S3 environment. Right, right. Yeah. So it's a whole new world and a lot more uh, possibilities for us. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so <laughs> you can see the kind of, when we started out, we showed what the Game of Thrones kind of, everything's nice and organized, and as we know, alliances change, and you know, anybody uh, can start going after whatever kingdom they, they feel that fits their, <laughs> fits their uh, <laughs> whatever they want to get to right now, Lord Baelish, but um, anyway, so what, we want to say with the, with uh, S3 is, you know, uh, we had that hierarchical, we weren't allowed to really move things around as CC true organizations ch change. Um, we talk about healthcare a lot because we, we do, as RPI, we have probably 70 plus, 70% 70 plus healthcare clients. So we see, um, you know, reorgs a ton we see hospitals you know coming together and forming mega hospitals buying up different organizations and it's very difficult to put them into the s3 structure you know you create a new department now or a new process level with this complete different organization and you have to try and fit their structure into what your defined structure already is and that may not be how they they do business and they cannot um, ramp up quick enough to do business the way you do and it, it creates a lot of problems political problems internally as well as problems with just um, managing the workforce so we um, in the global HR area you know it does give you that flexibility to easily copy and paste organization units where they truly are reflected and it can be done you know in an afternoon as opposed to spending weeks to months to prepare for an organization and get all of your data set up with the new structure and then filter down to all of your uh, jobs, your positions, and then down to your employees' position or assignments. Okay. So uh, currently, this is our hierarchy structure in S3. You're very used to seeing this. We've got, you know, one kind of leader process level and then all of the departments that feed up through that process level and generally it is driven by your GL. It's you know your cost center or your accounting unit and then all of your subs that come up underneath it. <laughs> and then yes, in GHR, you aren't locked into this hierarchical. So let's uh, think we, we have, we don't have anything yet to show that. We'll be showing that in a second, but um, oh. Matt's gonna talk, yeah, about oh. the organization unit components that help you with that flexibility. Right, now that everybody's all excited about what's in GHR, <laughs> um, as exciting as HR organizational structure can be. So right. people like me love this, most other people, no. <laughs> but you're on this webinar, so hopefully you're enjoying it. Um, so here's the basic uh, organization unit setup. Um, you can see that there's a lot of extra fields within here. It's probably hard to see on your screen um, right there, but you have the first basic hierarchical piece that really has to, it, it's fundamental for any kind of charting. You always have to have one organization reporting to something else. That's pretty standard. It's required. You have to do that. But then after that, we have a unit type, which is where we start to see that we can really create whatever we want to. This is all user definable. We do not have to be locked in to what Infor says. We can really start to reflect our organization as it truly is. And then these next fields are really, really the important ones and where we start to see a lot of depth and color coming to, these, uh, to your organization units. We have things like the person responsible, who is the assistant in that organization unit, who is the legal representative, and even who is the HR contact. 
These are really, really powerful because at this point we can, as soon as we have these on a form and we have them attached to the organization unit, we can start to invoke any of these things in a process flow. We can start to route uh, certain approvals to say the unit's vice president. It doesn't have to go to the supervisory structure anymore. We can send notifications directly to the HR contact telling them that something is happening in this organization unit. So you can see we have a lot of power just in those four fields right there. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about the unit type in a moment, but then the other piece is we've got some work assignment defaulting that we can do as well. So you can start to pop in the, uh, the cost centers or the project locations, things like that. Um, usually not as prevalent because you start to put those more on jobs and positions, but nonetheless, you can also start to put some of that onto the work assignment, or I'm sorry, onto the organization unit as well. So a lot, of, uh, a lot of things that you're able to do here. The other thing that is really, really important, and just as I was talking about how we can restrict certain uh, organization units from showing up on pick lists, we've got this button right in the middle here for include in select lists. Just that simple. When we're creating a new position and we want to say that it's going to be in a specific organization unit, and we created a new organization unit called Division of Medicine, for example, we can do that and we can also suppress that Division of Medicine from showing up in, as something selectable for somebody. Uh, we want to push them down to that lowest level um, and only the things that we're mapping over to the S3 side. So, talked about levels a lot already. So here's where we're actually able to define what these levels are. Um, we can put in anything that we want here. Um, we see a lot of times people will go in automatically when we're starting a GHR implementation or they've had an old GHR implementation, they'll go in and automatically feel like we're locked into that S3 structure. Right. So they put in automatically process level department and cost center. They mm -hmm. put those in and they're there and they say, well, that's, that's what our organization looks like. That is true, but it's what your organization looks like in the S3 side. So that really leads us into our next question. Right. So how can you use levels to really reflect what you need? This is where you'd say, you know, if I'm in education, I don't only have a department. Some of my departments are, you know, things, we have charter schools, which are a whole different organization outside of our regular school district. And we want to be able to reflect that. They're not quite a department. They're not quite a process level. They're their own thing. They're not even a complete separate company or organization. So we want to be able to reflect that and put that at the same level as the main school is. So we can assign them, you know, level one or level two is, you know, the schools and level two is also charter, school, charter schools. So in your org chart, you'll see them sitting at the same height, even though, you know, in S3, one may have been, it may have been a department under your process level for all of your schools. You weren't accurately able to reflect that. Um, you can see in, in corporate world where you can now bring regions and so say in some areas, the region is so small that it really is like a division in one of the larger regions. So you can say, you know, this really small region is at the same level as this division in one of the larger regions. And you can make those levels equal when you're looking at your organization structure, organization chart. So that leveling really does help you uh, reflect when they're all called org units, it's very difficult to say uh, which one uh, is, is above the other, and that's where your leveling comes in place. When you have you know, same levels across, you can tell which are, are higher, which roll up to the others, um, and which are on the same playing field. And we don't uh, have a slide reflecting this, but the uh, one thing that I'd invite you to look at in terms of this is because they're all defined by you, it's very easy for us to quickly and easily put together a report saying, okay, I want to see yeah. every single, you know, what are my current units that are active or what unit reports to what division, things like that. It's all user definable and you can easily personalize that list and see exactly, you know, what are my regions right now? You know, did we, do we have the East Coast still or not? Is that a region? Is that a division? What are we doing? And, you know, that's kind of why we talk about being able to start with reporting when you start your implementation, because what do you need to get to? And that'll really help you define what your levels are going to end up being. It's not the other way around where your organization's been set up and now you need to do pull some sort of report and you 
don't have the structure to enable that, and you have to go through you know all kinds of different data pools to put something together. If you define you know what it is that's important to you to report from in the beginning, then you can set some of your organization up mainly for reporting. You can do it for your for viewing as as your org chart, but you can do it as well for reporting. Any of my my HRIS people I always talk to because that was the life I lived for a very long time. This is huge. When the when the vice president walks in and says, "Okay, where's everybody in this unit?" You can pull this report very quickly and easily. It's all user defined. So, all right. So let's go into a couple examples of what we might have. Uh, so this is a little bit of a uh, a view of just a sample random corporate type structure. Um, so we've got a few things going on inside here. Um, it's kind of mirroring what we've got in the S3 world right mm -hmm. now, but it's just kind of a different display of it. And this chart I want to point out is something that you can see directly in GHR. You don't have to send it to a third party reporting tool. You start to see some of these structures. Um, wherever we see these little uh, the buttons underneath showing that there's organization units underneath it, you click on that and it bursts out that branch of the organization. So yeah, so for here we've got, you know, just for example, our company, okay? And then we took the liberty of adding in our regions. Again, this is something that we can define ourselves. And then here we start to see, all right, well, there's our process level, like we're very familiar. Right now we've got two of those three building blocks from the S3 world. Mm -hmm. We've got our company, our process level, and then we've got our departments underneath it. Um, so we've got all those built out right here, and you can see it's a, it's a pretty straightforward structure but we can make it a lot more complex if we want to. Definitely, and and again, if that's what you need, mm -hmm. GHR can take care of it. I mean, if you are a very hierarchical, simple, you know, if what S3 has worked for you, you can definitely reflect that like this in global HR. Mm -hmm. yeah. So okay. now, yeah, healthcare, yeah. so. So similar, you know, in, in healthcare, um, there is a lot of different things that are usually broken out based on what uh, type or, or what department generally it is. Um, so we've got here that we're showing, or I guess you can, mm -hmm. you can start there we go. opening, <laughs> yeah, sorry, uh, opening it up there. So here we've got it instead of just by company, you know, the network is the top level. You've got a ton of affiliates that are rolling up into this network and how are you going to be able to reflect that in your new global organization structure. So um, you can see here each of the hospitals are at that level one and then when you get down into the next levels um, you've got a lot more. If you were looking at a company process level department that's about where you stop. You aren't able to really reflect all of the things that roll up and nest up underneath each of these lines of business. Right. And, you know, it's very frequent in healthcare for us to have to answer the question of who are all of my people who are in a clinical area? So we can build those right into the structure. So we can mm -hmm. see right away, here's everybody in the clinical line or here's everybody in the administrative line. Uh, we can see all that very quickly and easily right from this chart. The other thing that's really powerful about this is because we're defining this and we can only we can send over just selective uh, organization units to the S3 side, we also are allowed to skip levels, which is also very powerful. If we have a situation, so we've got our hospital over here, but then we've got our urgent care clinic on the other side. And they don't have the they don't have as many layers, I guess we'd say, or levels within the organization. It's much more straightforward, and we just have our urgent care clinic, and then it jumps straight down to cost centers. So we're able to break it down right away. We've skipped. You can see over here we've got our cost centers in the hospital that are all the way down here, but we've on the other side skipped over the department, the division, and the lines because it's a very straightforward simple Small structure right right so we've got that flexibility we can skip all of these um, the only thing we're going to have to do is just make sure that those uh, the that base level whatever's going to be allowed on the work assignment has some sort of mapping that's going back to s3 mm -hmm. but other than that we have very few rules on it awesome. and then we've got another one here for uh for education um, so you, you do see how we've broken it out into, uh, you know, the splitting out between the administration level and then, uh, you know, the school personnel. 
and then at schools we've got them by region or by area in the uh, district and then we've got even broken down all the way to grade level so there's lots you see with the three different types of samples that um, we've got mapped out here there's a lot of different ways to structure your organization and um, being able to go into your implementation if you haven't gone through GHR yet or if you have really start looking and mapping it out on paper or on Visio and, and really try and see the different ways your organization can be reflected before you go in and decide to start to design your system. And, and by no means are we saying that this is how you should lay things out. It's mm -hmm. really going to be up to you. You can reflect your organization as it really is. So. We just kind of want to show you that possibilities are endless and without a few little examples for you to start from, you know, you, you really don't understand what you know what it's capable of right a lot of flexibility and a lot of power mm -hmm. so you've heard me say a few times now that you know we only have to send over certain organization units to the s3 side and that's done very very easily uh, within the system if you go into your process server administrator you'll see that i think it's like the second or third topic underneath there is cross references if you've done a lot of the, uh, if you've built out your interface already to S3, you're familiar with this. And within there, there's one that's called process level department. Process level department at that point is the one where we're really able to define exactly which HR organization and which HR org unit is going to map to those three components of the department on the S3 side. So we've got our HR organization, our HR org unit, and we're gonna send it to this company, this specific process level, and this specific department. When I was just saying a few minutes ago that you know we have that uh, the division of medicine or something like that, I wouldn't even put a record in the process level department uh, cross-reference table for that because we're never going to invoke it on a work assignment and we don't want to send it to S3. There's no reason for it to be over there. Um, so what does this really look like? So we've got our organization unit 62 over here, which is our human resources department. You can see that we have it defined as a department uh, uh, level, as a unit type. And then the cross-reference table right there is just showing us that our HR organization and our org unit of 62 is going to go to company 10, process level HOSP, and department is human. So right there, we've accomplished that mapping. We can have a lot more levels if we want to in there, but we just have to send over the ones that we really need on the S3 side. Again, and that's if you're keeping uh, finance and procurement so your GL can be balanced and obviously you'll have to if you're using payroll you'll do that but if you're not using loss and payroll and you've already gone to 11 or you're in the midst of going to 11 financials and procurement you know <laughs> fair game you can do anything you, you'd really like to without having to worry about um, mapping back to S3 mm -hmm. Okay, so um, actor org unit access. This is really where you get that functionality to um, turn people who are not supervisors of potentially other people into supervisors. Um, what we see is a lot of times a sort of admin needs to be able to view a bunch of people on their floor or in their area. If it's a school, you know, maybe it is a district admin that needs to see everybody. And they're not able to do it in the traditional S3 world because if they are not a supervisor with direct reports, uh, you really kind of have to mess with your system a lot. You have to mess with HR 07 to try and trick it into letting them see everybody that they need to see. Here, there is this concept of uh, actor org unit access. It is a security role that is part of an HR generalist, uh, out of the box, kind of out of the HR generalist role. So it's, it's one of the, uh, there's a class that goes underneath that, that is the HR org unit. So even if you have a generalist that, you have multiple generalists and they should all only see the people in their own organization, they're able to use the actor org unit to see just all, you'll define what the org unit is that that security class can see. Same thing, if you, you strip a lot of that, uh, a lot of the access out of that HR generalist role to turn that into almost like a mock supervisor or direct, uh, direct supervisor role and that gives somebody who like Matt may need to see you know 15 people in his organization but Matt's not a manager of people Matt's a manager of projects 
And um, so he, by, by a hierarchical structure, wouldn't have access to any of those people. I can give Matt that actor org unit role class and let uh, define that org unit for him. And now he is able to go into manager space and see all of the people he needs to see. And based on security, he's able to action if he can action on them. Uh, if he just needs to view their information, he's able to do that. He's only able to approve certain things. We give him that access. So that's really where you can, the power of turning your hierarchical supervisory structure or hierarchical organization structure into that matrix kind of uh, fit. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so we see here, it's really good for matrix organizations for those decentralized organizations. So you do have field offices all over the place and the HR generalist out for the West Coast isn't, shouldn't be able to see the rest of the organization. Maybe they shouldn't be able to see, um, they should only see one little department in their whole org unit. You can even level or uh, le get it down to that level for them. And then um, as the example I was talking about, the administrators who aren't true supervisors are able to see people. Um, I mentioned a little while ago, you know, with all those extra fields that we can attach on the on the org unit themselves, um, the things like the HR contact and the person responsible, we can start to use those in our IPA development. So I just kind of have a very quick slide here to say, okay, we're looking at the HR organization unit business class within IPA. And when we're looking at it in process designer there, you can start to see that we actually can pull out the values on those fields. So if I wanna see exactly who is the person responsible on this specific organization unit, I can pull that when I get that into the flow at that point, I can then assign it and create a brand new in-basket for that person. So if they're looking at their in-baskets, all of a sudden we created a new task for them to say, okay, here's your department administrator in-basket. Now you can go in and actually take an action and it can route through this person. It doesn't have to go through the supervisory structure as every flow is almost right. out of the box delivered that way. Right. Um, so we can really make it whatever we need to. You could create a senior vice president uh, in basket. You could do just about anything you needed to. The important takeaway is that you've got the fields on the org unit and you can pull them out wherever you need them. Okay, so copy branch functionality. So now we're gonna get into some really cool functionality that Global HR has that never existed in S3. And it makes your reorgs and your acquisitions and any types of changes to your structure a lot easier. In the old days, you would have to, uh, you know, your, your finance department would give you the new cost centers, the new accounting units, and they're like, okay, this is gonna be our new organization, go. And then you're, you as an HR admin were, were responsible for developing this whole new organization. You had to build out your process level, you had to build out your departments, um, then you had to build out any jobs or positions that would start using this process level or this, uh, this uh, cost center or uh, new accounting unit. And then if you had the employees that were already converted in, you had to populate all of that onto them as well very long, arduous process. Now with this, and we're gonna talk, Matt's gonna talk about moving, and I'll talk about copying. With copying, you are able to go and take an organization that's already created, and if you have one that's gonna be similar to this new organization that you're, you need to create, you will copy that and literally just paste it, it wherever it's gonna roll up, whatever organization unit it rolls up into and then you put in, populate the new information, the new GL information in there, and everything flows down. So it'll flow down into those new departments, quote unquote, or flow down into any positions that you've got built into it. Um, so I feel like you know this say, is a huge time saver because it gives you a template for creating your new organizations. Right. And the other thing that's important to note on the copy, and even when we talk about the move functionality is, it, like everything else in GHR, it's driven by effective date. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that it's gonna ask us when we're copying an org unit is say, well, when is this actually effective? So when we populate that, you can see that, you know, here's our as of now, we set the effective date out, you know, 
several, like a couple years from now. And what we're able to do at that point is change our as of date. And we'll see that as of September 1st, 2020, that new organization that we just copied from this branch now exists and it's built itself into the hierarchy right away. Um, very easy for us to look forward and look back. We can also see what the organization looked like three years ago if Prior we changes, made the change. Yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of power for us to be able to do that. And now, report and report on, because I, mm -hmm. I don't want to take for granted that people know how the as of date function works in global HR. But when you put that date in there, it rolls your system to that date and it pretends like that is today. So you can do any kind of headcount reporting, any any other type of reporting you need to do, it will exist as mm -hmm. if all those employees are already there or are anybody that's pen terming term pending, they will already have been removed from the system. Mm -hmm. A lot so. of functionality there, mm -hmm. so and very easy for not that anybody ever has to look back in time and say, Never. "What did this place yeah. used to look like three years ago?" <laughs> Who reported to whom at and, this on this date? Right, yeah. right. And not that you know anybody would ever you know we would never have a VP or anything like that come in and say what would this look like we, that would never happen we would <laughs> never have to say what will the org chart look like in three years there it is. here you go <laughs> <laughs> surprise <laughs> so moving sections um, same kind of idea um, what we're able to do um, along with the copy branches we're able to easily move things around, reorganizations, restructuring. Um, if we acquire a new practice, if we're a healthcare organization and we went out and bought another hospital, or, um, or if we decided that we're going to divest ourselves of a certain, uh, certain pr branch or line, we can definitely do that. Um, again, everything that we've got here, it's gonna be effective dated, and we're able to very simply, very quickly, and very easily just select one of those branches come right over here and uh, select it and say, okay, we're going to move it under a different org unit. So as Melissa said, you know, in, in the S3 days, we'd have to go through and restructure everything and move things around and do all this extra, you know, extra rigmarole to get things lining up in the system. Mm -hmm. Right here, we have one simple click, basically. And then from there, again, it's going to say, what's our effective date and what does it now report to? As soon as we answer those two simple questions, all of a sudden, we've it's moved our IT department from one division and reporting to a different uh, department. We've moved it over to another one. Two simple clicks. Yeah. So. This, yeah, this is kind of one of those wow functionality things that you know Matt and I like to do whenever we're talking to clients or having demos uh, set up for them because you can say it. You know, we've told clients that. Yeah, it's so easy in global HR. Doing this is so easy. But then when you actually show it and you right click and you copy or you move and you pop it down there and then you start opening up those positions and those employees that used to be in this other organization and the, you can see all of that information change just with that one or two clicks. Mm -hmm. It's so, you know, people are just kind of like, what? Where was this? Why is my? <laughs> why did my life have to be so difficult? And then it's hard to go back to your regular job at S3, knowing that you know some functionality out there exists to make your life easier. So if you have a big reorg planned, maybe plan your implementation <laughs> around mm -hmm. you know something like that because um, it, it really does save a lot of time. And, and without with that future dating, that effective dating, you can prep all of that stuff. And it's not about getting everything ready and then, okay, let's flip the switch on a Sunday where payroll starts so everything on Monday can, can be ready and, and we haven't really, we can't test it in production to make sure everything is gonna go right. You know, you can test everything and pilot everything by doing it with that effective date. And then as soon as the effective date comes on, you, you don't really have to do anything. No. You just, you know, it's there. We might have- We have a question, do we, we wanna take it now? Yeah. Absolutely. Go ahead. Um, when you move a department in this way, does Global HR automatically update, i.e. supervisor slash department? Yes. Mm -hmm. Everything, <laughs> yes, yes. So, so if you roll, if IT was under uh, this, is this Canadian? What is CAD uh, here? CAD, the, the CAD department. CAD, Computer oh, CAD department, design, yeah. yes. Okay, so. so IT used to be under CAD, so when you roll it under um, 
North American, looks like it's straight under North American here. It will no longer show CAD as it's uh, who it rolls up to and all of that organization. So those vice presidents, um, any of those positions that it rolled up to, any of the positions, any of the accounting units that it rolled up to, all of that will now be updated with the ones for North America. Um, Right. Supervisors will stay. Right. I mean, your supervisors, you're assuming that right now your supervisory structure stays intact. If you have to move your supervisory structure, you can do that. Um, and, and same thing, everything kind of the positions that that supervisor held will move with that supervisor. Um, it, but along those lines, if, if we wanted to do something like set up an HR org or actor org unit for like a senior vice president or something and that person already had the ability to see all of North America. When we move that over, that uh, actor org unit responsibility will cascade down. So if that person goes into manager space at that point, they'll actually be able to see the IT department that right. has moved over. We didn't change the supervisor, we mm -hmm. haven't touched that structure, but because they're under that other, this org unit that they already have access to, they can now see all of that. And it's then actionable for them if we allow, allow that to happen. So, so hopefully that, that answered your question. Yeah. Wow, and a few exclamation points. <laughs> <laughs> See, I mean, it, it really is, I want to say life changing, work life changing, <laughs> you know? Um, because, you know, Matt and I came from the business side. We've not lived as consultants our whole life. And we've done, we've ha been responsible for having to do these things at our old organizations. And I mean, mm -hmm. I remember how much, and, and I still do this for a lot of organizations who are our clients. And it, it's time consuming, and there's a lot of auditing that has to take place, which brings me back to, makes me think about the audit trail mm -hmm. on this. Everything's still there. You see this move happening. You see the date that it happened. So it's not as if it never existed over here under CAD if you want to look back into your history without having to do the effective date change. Right. And, and the nice thing is, again, we can attach specific reason codes to these kinds of things if we want to start to make it ask for a reason code. Why are you moving this whole section? Yeah. We're going to tra trace through at that point why you did it, who did it, when they did it, mm -hmm. and we can easily see, all right, here's everything that they changed. Mm -hmm. So, it, so it makes life easier for your auditors that come in or for you to get that information to your auditors when they come in. Right. I will say it was life changing because I had a particularly great <laughs> vice president. I loved him dearly, but he was <laughs> always about the organization chart and he would always want to see, well, what, what if we do this? What does it look like? Mm -hmm. So this actually did save a lot of time when I was on that side. So I loved it. <laughs> All right. Thanks for the question. That was great. Mm -hmm. So, best practices. Um, here's some of the things that we've seen in the field. Um, and, and really, I think this is kind of the, the biggest, most important takeaway um, as, a, as a quick takeaway from this presentation. Um, you can identify and build the structure that is meaningful to your organization. We're not locked into just those three components. Uh, we can really do anything that we really need to on it. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you want to populate the resources into the HR org fields. So, you know, as Matt was talking about earlier, use these fields. So think about and plan what kind of approvals that you want to put in place. Um, these are things that you either don't have today or you have really complex IPAs to circumvent the the hierarchical supervisory structured in order to get other people to um, to approve. And a lot of times that's, you manually hard code somebody in there. So that means when they move, you constantly have to maintain that IPA to have the correct person for that approval. So this really does let you set it and forget it. So definitely, you know, think, be thoughtful when you fill those pieces out and use them. Don't say, oh, we've never used them before. We don't have a ministry, so let's not worry about it and just kind of leave it. Right. I've seen quite a few clients actually who have that information, but they house it in a separate kind of saddlebag system. So we always know that this department is actually run by this department administrator. Mm -hmm. There's now a place for it right in the system. So um, cross-reference mapping of only what's needed. So you can build out a very, very complex organizational structure 
And the only things that you really have to build as a cross-reference to S3 are just the ones that really need to be there. So you can for be as, K yeah. And, and for GL to, to balance. And a lot of times it's not gonna be a lot of information. No, no, yeah. so. Yeah. Um, the copy and move branches. Again, I'm a self-professed lover of that portion of it. Yeah. So yeah. Um, very quick and easy to move things. Um, very, very easy for us to do. And anybody can really set it up. It's, it's very nice and easy, so. And then the last one there is your effective dating as everything is in global HR driven by effective dates um, on the, in the S3 world. It gets really easy to do your 1 1 1950, or um, just a lot of times you just use one date because it just makes it easier for other things for you not to error out in other things. Using your effective dates in global HR will give you that true uh, look into when things happen. You don't want 1 1 1950 to be the date for adding a new affiliate to your organization because that's not when it happened. It happened, you know, 1 1 2018. And you want to be able to ensure that all of the organization units and positions and jobs and work assignments reflect that date when it changed. You don't want to have to think about, oh, is it going to cause a mess with my effective dated positions? So that is one of the things you have to think about. Effective, you need to use the correct effective dating, but you do want to ensure that it's going to reflect correctly um, half the time, you know, for two years this job rolled up to this organization and then after this this job now rolls up to this one and you'll have a really nice audit trail and history trail if you do use your effective dates correctly mm -hmm. and then it helps you with being able to pre-populate all of that stuff well before your your change or your reorg happens and then you don't really have to worry and you're not working weekends and evenings and everything trying to get everything in by the time that that organization is live and needs to be paid I don't know if you had any more on, on the effective dating. No, I, you covered a lot of it, so yeah. yeah. It's powerful and might as well use it. So. Right, right. Yeah. So I think we can, we can flip to our contact info and take some questions if we've got some that sure. are building up. Sure, absolutely. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this here. Uh, regarding the point in time capabilities, when you change the as of date, is it truly what the system looked like on the exact date, or does it take into account changes that are entered date? For example, we need an employee list as of June 1st, 2017. An employee termed on effective 520, but wasn't keyed into the system until 625. Will the EE show on the June 1st report? The answer is no, they will not show. That effective date is gonna be the thing that really drives it at that point. Mm -hmm. So um, everything that you're doing within the system, when you're entering those effective dates, it's placing it in the queue and really putting it as of that right. specific date. So as of 1-1, one, one, your person hadn't entered that retro change yet. So if you really were there on 1-1 one, one, or 6-1, whatever it is, um, that change, manager forgot to put it in, that person hasn't been terminated yet, and it really does look at the system right. as it but was. But then it, it applies retro. It right will on. apply it retroactively, so, yeah. So, so I guess the, the answer, and this is, this is something that I feel like, even though I haven't worked as much in the HR space, but it's, it's sort of a loss in the software thing, is, is the system is going to work exactly as you would want it to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's not always intuitive for us, but <laughs> the, the purpose of why it was put in there works. So, um, right, and the, and the good go kind of uh, corollary to that is, Remember, with the with the audit log, we will not only see that you know, okay, well, this person's not technically here, but if we were looking at that, if we actually did pull that report on on, on June first, yeah. and all of a sudden we see that this person is gone, we look in the audit log and we see, oh, okay, well, Slazak just entered that at the mm -hmm. end of the month, and now he ran this new report, and there that there it is. So one of the That's things that we see on the FSM side is that you can click on almost anything and get that like automatic, like these are all the edits, it's the same, it's mm -hmm. the same thing, just, it's almost like a drill down capability yep. right. of, of audits. Um, so, and there, there is one other corollary, I'm sorry. Oh, please. <laughs> um, the only thing that I would say for that point in time capability, if you're looking in the future, this seems obvious and kind of counterintuitive, if you have a future dated higher, that person will not show up there. So that's just the one little proviso on it. Why not? 
um, because it's not actually going to commit that transaction until that actually happens. So if you ever have a no-show or something like that, they're not really counted until you pass that start date. Is that so. true for all future actions or just, or just the hire? As far as I know, it's just the hire. Yeah, yeah. it's specific so to the, the hire. So not 100% sure on the hire until they come through. That's, right. that's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely we welcome more questions. I have my own high-level question, right? So you know, clearly there's all this added uh, uh, flexibility in how you organize your structure. Then there's the reality of you know, everything's been shoehorned into probably what S3 had in the past. So when we talk about that process of, of, of implementing GHR, uh, I'm just curious whether this is something where you see people start from that shoehorn S3 and then start like expanding or rearranging, or whether you see people just start from scratch on a whiteboard and then map. I mean, how, how does that work? Or do you have any uh, war story? I mean, I, 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 I see it starting with that shoehorned. Um, generally, you're like, okay, I've got to get everything out on paper and this is what it looks like now. Now let's start talking, let's question each of these organization units and what their function is and where they really should go. Mm -hmm. And then usually there's a few iterations that have to go through, not just HR, I mean, if you're gonna change your org structure in a system, it has to be risen all the way up to your executive levels. And mm -hmm. get approval. And get approval. So right. especially when you're looking at multiple affiliates or, or multiple organizations that have been acquired that still have their own leadership, it's not always quick and easy to change your structure in your global HR. It may take months to be able to get the buy-off from everybody to say, okay, yeah, I, th I think that's the way it truly is reflected. And you have to get, you know, again, some of the politics out of the way mm -hmm. a lot of times um, mm -hmm. to be able to make some of these changes. So keep that in mind when you're ready to implement and, and begin that design phase is sometimes it's not so, so I might say life. that from everything that I learned today it doesn't sound like I'm committed to, to whatever I do so why not mm -hmm. I could just slam in whatever and then make the changes and yeah. you say no um. <laughs> <laughs> just playing the exact role here <laughs> it, you, you could but again it, it goes into some of that buy in you really right. want to make sure that everybody is agreeing with it and you know there is some of that political stuff that we have to get through sometimes well, then, and on then that. on the system side if you put something in there's a lot of Hidden stuff that go in in the back end, notifications being created, email templates being created. If you want to change something, you know how difficult it is in S3. Um, you want to delete something and it says there's people attached to this position. Right. There's uh, somebody pending payroll in here and you have to kind of start at the front and back your way out. Mm -hmm. It's not as easy to back your way out because now there's all these templates that are, uh, that are associated with these org units that are built the system builds them. So a lot of times I've had to, especially when it comes to uh, deciding one organization versus multiple organizations at that very top level, and I've started building it out and using multiple process levels for different EINs, and then we piloted it and it didn't quite work well, and they're like, you know what, we're not gonna be sharing these employees, let's do two organizations. I had to wipe everything out and start from scratch because there was so much that was embedded in there. I couldn't back my way out to remove one of the process levels away and create a separate organization out of it. Mm -hmm. So there are, you can kind of build a little straw man. Um, it's just how far down you go, the further down you go, the more difficult it's going to be to reverse out of it and, and change what. So, uh, so they were talking about the, the, the the main, if, if you forget my term, we're gonna say social structure, when we talk about the things where, you know, maybe the supervisors are crisscross and so forth, what you're hoping is that that is tracked in some off system or mm -hmm. third party mm -hmm. system way. You know, if it's not, we're really dependent on them to sort of know, hey, this is the reality that, that we don't admit in a system, but that really right. goes on. Right. And, and to then make the case for tracking that. Yeah, and, and I have seen a couple clients who actually do have that all built out. Mm -hmm. um, where I was saying that the client who had the, uh, the saddlebag system that had mm -hmm. all of their, you know, the senior VPs and all that, they also had a very well-defined hierarchy built within this other system to say, okay, well, this department reports to this parent department, and this parent department is in this division, and it rolls up to this VP level. So th there's a lot of things. Everybody can have it built out you know, as they need it, and 
depending upon how much they've already thought about it, it could already exist. And we kind of hawk that in one of our other uh, 10 projects, get ready for your GHR implementation. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the projects is take a look at what your structure is and your supervisory structure. And if it doesn't reflect what's in your system, start mapping that out now. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that is, those are some of the things we go through. We do um, pre-GHR assessments for, some, for a lot of clients, actually. And um, if they have you know, that six-month runway before they're ready to implement or a year or something, uh, we come up with what are the things that need to change now or you may not want to change them in your s3 system because there's a lot of work and sometimes the system doesn't accommodate it but let's let's figure out and let's map out what it's going to look like so you can condense your design time um, when you start your implementation and condensing condensing design time means condensing dollars because you don't have consultants sitting there talking you through all of these things and trying to make the decisions with you um, you're able to do that kind of offline after uh, you know a workshop with us to, to help you through that.